Hello, everybody, and welcome to Panel Fest 2023. Huge thanks to Abstract Hops and Market My Brewery for their support and for helping keep events like this 100% free and accessible to all. We could not continue putting out all the content we do without the support of our wonderful industry partners. And thanks to all of you for being dedicated to growing stronger together. I hope you enjoyed the 10 panels we have for you, and I can't wait to share a pint with you later this year at CBP Connects Charleston. This is December 4, 5, and 6 in Charleston, South Carolina. You can learn more at cbpconnects.com. And now, on to our first panel. For a brewery to see maximum success, effective communication must exist between departments. Unfortunately, there's often a great disconnect between front of house and back and beyond. In this session, I'm joined by panelists across brewery roles to discuss strategies to improve intra-brewery communication. But now, let's meet our guest. I'd love to hear a quick 60 seconds about you, your brewery, or where you work, and how many people work there. And Brittany, because you are to the right of me, you get to go first. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. My name is Brittany Weiss. I'm the HR manager at Kettle House Brewing Company. We are a regional craft brewer based out of Missoula, Montana. We've been in existence since 1995, and we have about 40 employees, give or take. And communication is a huge focus of us. It's something that we have struggled with in the past. In the six years that I've been at Kettle House, We've really put a high focus on trying to refine that and continue to grow. And I think we do a few things right and have a few more things to work on. I'm excited to learn from you today. And Montana is one of my favorite states to visit. What do you love best about Montana? Ooh, you can find me outside any minute of the day. I mean, we've got great beer, so I've got to mention that. But we just have beautiful outdoor spaces. That's why Kettle House, our mission is to match the quality of our beer to the quality of the Montana outdoor experience. And that's a pretty tall order. So we do our best. I need to come visit again very, very soon. Now, Jen, you're up. Hi, I'm Jen Tuman. I am the business uh, development manager at Jamesport Brewing Company. We opened here in Ludington, Michigan, on the shores of Lake Michigan in uh, the year 2000. So this is our 23rd year. Uh, we have about 75 to 80 on staff all time um at, at peak time sorry we're a tourist town here um only a handful in the brewery a lot of it we have a full service restaurant as a brew pub so a lot of that is front of house staff but yeah we struggled uh we, we've we've made a lot of improvements over the last year <laughs> that i've been back um kind of the same situation britney's been in you know just we have we have room to grow too. So I'm looking forward to learning from all of you as well as sharing what what's worked for us. That's the best part about all these panels, learning from one another and kind of sharing ideas. And again, and Brittany, it was awesome to hang out with you in Milwaukee at CBP Connects. Yeah. That was such a great time. It was yeah, so much that fun. Was awesome. <laughs> yeah, Josh, your turn. And I think you were somewhat the inspiration for this panel. So I'd love for you to share a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, I feel like we've been talking about this for a couple of years now, but I'm not currently at a brewery. I actually work for Brew Logics uh, in partnership with Market My Brewery, helping breweries better connect with consumers who are seeking the experiences that they are looking for. Uh, but previously to, to joining the Brew Logics and taking on this role, I worked for an Anheuser Busch owned craft brewery um, down in Houston, Texas. And at our peak, I think we had 220 employees um, and during my six years that I was there. And you know, when you think about the larger organization, there was over 10,000 employees. So there was a lot of things uh, moving and shaking down. And uh, communication is such an important thing when everyone's trying to move towards the same goal, but doesn't really understand what everybody else is doing or how some of those functions work. So I'm really looking forward to kind of sharing what worked for us in our organization. Um, and then also being able to learn from everybody else and continue to give back to this industry. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here, Josh. And thus far, it seems like every person we've talked to, we've seen an increased number of employees that, you know, the companies have seen. But Allison, this, something tells me this might not be the case when we talk about Lady Justice right now. That is accurate. Uh, hello, my name is Allison Wisneski, and I am the Director of Marketing and Sales at Lady Justice Brewing. We have 10 employees, so uh, the very opposite. But I know there's a lot of folks who are listening in who probably have a similar amount of employees. Um, that includes both our full and part-time staff. Um, so super small, um, and we are a mission-based uh, brewery. So uh, we promote the status of women, girls, and non-binary people in the state of Colorado through grants. Uh, and we do that through Collaboration Brews, our membership uh, program and more. We've been around for nine years and we've been in our tap room for three and a half. We opened two days before COVID. <laughs> and where Fun, are you so... right now, 
Um, while Lady Justice is located in beautiful Aurora, Colorado, uh, I am sitting in the lab at Mobcraft in Milwaukee. Uh, we are doing our collaboration brew for their um, advent calendar box, and we're aging it, so we need to start it now to get it aging for Christmas. So um, Henry is a good friend of mine. We went to college together at UW-Whitewater. Go Warhawks! And now we get to brew beer together uh, just a few years later. I'm going to pretend like college was recent. <laughs> well, Allison, I hope to hang out with you in person before too long. Well, everybody, much. <laughs> these issues in communication, they happen whether you're a small brewery or even the large ones, you know, and I want to talk about diagnosing communication problems. Like I said, we all face them. When in each of your experiences, did you realize that something needed to be done to improve communication between departments? And Brittany, we will start with you on this one, then I swear we'll just bounce around following. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with asking a lot of questions. A problem emerges and you have to get to the root of what exactly is going on. And I think a lot of times it starts with silos. People don't have a good, strong understanding of what the other department does or what they're working on to move that ball forward. And people fill in the gaps with their own story. So, you know, that sales department never does anything or those production guys always cut out at 2.30. And they're failing to take into account that, well, yeah, but they've been there since four in the morning. And, you know, trying to bridge that gap so that people have a higher level of understanding of one another. Jen, how about you? When did you first realize that these communication problems exist? So for us, a lot of our front of house staff, uh, they cycle. We have a lot of students. They might only be here for, uh, you know, for the summer if they're going to college or they're young and they don't. We in Michigan, you can serve alcohol at 17. We choose to allow that uh, servers at 18. So a lot of them haven't even had a beer before. So recognizing that it's really hard for them to sell the beer when they can't even taste it or try it and trying to communicate the, how they can communicate to the customer when when they haven't had it themselves. So that's that's, I think, one of our biggest the biggest problems that we recognize. So we dove into some quizzes and popular beers that people might recognize and just server education constantly. Yeah, I think Brittany hit the, the key point that we ran into is like that siloing aspect where nobody really has a full grasp of what everybody else is doing. And but everybody else is busy and everybody else is constantly trying to move that ball forward. So yeah, I think for us, we just quickly realized that we were running into frustrations and people were getting emotionally upset with each other. And it's like, hey, let's pull this back a little bit. Let's really understand um, what everybody's doing and that we're all trying to achieve the same goal. And how can we break that down where you're not sitting in a thousand meetings that aren't necessarily relevant to you, but really just get to the key points. Here's what's valid for, for each aspect. And then let's all go in and be successful. And I think, you know, being able to break that down really helped us uh, kind of decide where people need to be and when and, uh, and really get everybody on the same team again. I think for us, we had, um, and I think this is just normal with any small business, um, the assumption that you know, everybody knows exactly what's going on at all times. So you don't need to communicate it crystal clearly because obviously how couldn't you know, there's only so many of us, you must know what's happening. Um, that is not the truth. Um, and so we are very big on over communicating um, that has been a game changer for us, where if we're saying something, there might be one person in the room who didn't know it and everybody else does. It doesn't matter. Hearing it again is really helpful. So leaning into over communication of, hey, don't touch those cases back there. Those are going out for delivery um, when you think you want to be filling the beer fridge up front. That's like the most perfect and quickest example I can think of because it definitely just happened to us. So um, just that it's really clear, helpful, and useful to, especially the higher up that you are, over communicate the simple things. Um, that has been, since we've started doing that, I think has been like the biggest change for us where everybody feels like, okay, I'm at least in the know on the basics of what's happening this week in the tap room. Now, Allison, I, I've been to your brewery before. I could probably throw a stone from the front to the back. Does being a smaller brewery make effective communication a little bit easier? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one might think so, but I think, I mean, part of what I just said, right? So that over communication part has been a game changer for us. And I also do think that because we're smaller um, and because we're mission based, um, our team is super invested. Everybody who works at Lady Justice very specifically wants to be there based on the mission and wanting to see it succeed. And so um, passion gets really lifted in there, which means emotion gets brought in there. And so 
people are really intrinsically tied to the work that they're doing, even if they're doing one shift a week because they work a full time job and just like really care about what we have going on. And so making sure um, something that's been really useful for uh, Betsy, who's the co-founder of Lady Justice uh, and the head brewer and my wife. Um, so she and I are really clear and we say it as often as we can um, at our monthly staff meetings and at our biweekly leadership team meetings. Nobody needs to care as much as she and I do. This is not the life or death of anybody else who works in that space. And it's not the life or death of us, right? So if people are getting really emotionally invested in something, it's a, hey, take a step back. Let's talk about this. And finding out what are, what is it that they really care about and what is it that's really affecting them in this um, usually can help take a little bit of the heat off while also reminding them like, work is work. This is just a job. I know that you care about the mission and I love that you care about the mission. And this shouldn't be affecting you this heavily and emotionally. Let it affect us. Don't let it affect you. Right. So, um, you know, if there's interpersonal drama that's going on, if something went wrong in front of house and they were like, oh, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to stress them out. That's not how this works. You tell us because this is work and that's okay. And let us fix it. Let us step in. Let us be helpful. Um, we just, the, the deep caring of our staff is like, it sounds insane, but like is a problem, right? Because they want so badly for it to go so well, be so perfect. So it's really helpful for us to have those check-ins and we allow staff to bring anything that they want to the staff meetings. And so they can bring that stuff to say, hey, like the energy here has been kind of crappy lately. What's going on? And people can talk about, oh, it's been a really stressful month. And they get like, great, let's talk about it so that everybody catches the vibe and then we can move forward, right? Um, we really open the door for that type of communication and it's been really helpful. And then it allows us to have like fun at the end of the staff meeting, right? When it's like, okay, oh God, we got that off our chest. Now let's do like an off flavors tasting. Fun, right? And what <laughs> I think open the door is huge for like, I'm oh, sorry, Andrew, but for oh, effective communication, like being able to kind of in the moment to be able to say like, hey, take a step back, don't stress on this. And then really just sharing, like effectively communicating within your department to the proper level so that it can effectively be communicated across departments. There's nothing worse when two people who just really don't understand what each department does are going at each other. And you're like, whoa, 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 kind of let's slow this down. I understand that you have concerns and you have concerns. And I think craft beer is amazing that everybody is so passionate of it, about it. You know, very few of us look at craft beer as a job. It really is part of our lifestyle and our identity. And when you get that tied in, it's really easy to get charged. So, you know, effectively communicating within your department to allow for effective communication between apartments is something that I think is often not discussed either. A good one, Josh. Now, looking at, you know, this is such a broad topic of effective communication. If you had to look at all your experiences at your brewery or your business, is there a certain area where communication begins to fall as ineffective? You know, if you had to pinpoint the biggest mistake you see in communication, is it between the two certain departments? Is it between, you know, lack of information? Where do you see the greatest disconnect between brewery departments? I'll, I'll piggyback what Allison said, which I think it's that mistake of assuming that everyone knows and and a reluctance. You know, I don't want to be condescending, so I don't want to keep reiterating the same thing. But that's where things go sideways. Say it and say it again and then say it two more times because there's somebody that missed it. There was somebody that was, you know, had earplugs in and or was out that day. So it I think it starts with just that assumption of obviously they would know we're doing that. Yeah, I second that. Yeah. We, kind of, we have like a, a posting, like a bulletin board where we try to, with so many people and so many managers, just try to keep everybody on the same page. And in my mind, they're always going to check the board, but reminding myself that they're not. And we have to verbally communicate that as well as reminding them to check the board and changing the color of the posters and uh, tricks to get them to, to pay attention. So I think uh, one of the, the funniest stories that we have, so we do a lot of email communication and we have to drag some people kicking and screaming to use their email. And somebody, there was like concert tickets at the amphitheater or something fun available and somebody didn't check their email and then they overheard some people talking about it and they like just hit the roof of like, nobody tells me anything, blah, 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 blah. And they're in the office, like all worked up about these concert tickets they didn't know. And the head brewer looked at him and was like, did you check your email? Go check your email. And they go and check their email and they're like, sorry, I know you always say I need to check my email before I start my shift. <laughs> like, you got to make sure that you weren't in the know before you get mad. 
Well, I think that brings up an interesting point too, with like, the, you know, there is so many great technology aspects that allow communication to be more streamlined, but I think those can equally cause as much chaos. I know for us, like we had Microsoft Teams, we had email, we had Slack, you had all these other individual channels. And then you have, I, I was talking to these guys a little bit earlier, but like what they called the sales marketing admin, kind of the carpet walkers, right? So they're in the office all day. So they're constantly seeing their emails come in well, the brewer who's on the brew deck all day is not seeing the emails come in. And so there's a, this assumption that everybody's on the same page or when something comes out, you're immediately seeing it. And that's just not the reality. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, all of these communication platforms, you really need to be strategic on what you're using and what it's used for and set that standard on how it should be used because they all can work in conjunction, but they also all can tear you apart. It, I can't agree more so chris you just asked the question tech perspective various ways you approach communication from small to big so i can say for us um i hold the same truths that i do i run our marketing which means i run our social media and our email every single lady justice social media post has our hours listed i list them every week because if we have events we're a 45 person capacity tap room if we have an event the tap room is closed it's that simple um so i make it very abundantly clear and i post it every week the version of what we do for our staff, our tapper manager, Jess, is really great about sending out an email at the beginning of the week. That's basically like an expanded version of the social media post that includes event information that people need to know. Hey, this one is not private. Reserve this spot in the back of the tap room. Hey, this event is private. We'll be closed at this time. I could use two employees. Does someone want to come and pick up an extra shift? Like all that information exists in there. The food is this. The host is this. Uh, make sure to give them 15 minutes to talk. They, they're really good about that. And then we use Slack. So beyond the weekly email, getting folks used to uh, knowing what Slack is during the job interview, we say, we use Slack. Are you comfortable having that added to your phone? It's a no cost option and it keeps you in the loop on what's happening. You are not required to check it when you are not working. We make that really clear. Um, that's where we'll drop in and use the at channel so that it alerts people if there's something that needs to be done. Like there's an emergency, hey, the tap room's closed because of weather. Um, hey, somebody left their wallet, like those types of things, we'll put that information into Slack and we have fun channels. And so beyond the channels that are work related, fun channels have been a game changer for our staff because they truly enjoy being with one another and spending time, but we're a small tap room and most shifts are solo. So that's where they get to catch up with each other. If somebody's having like, hey, I'm having friends over for drinks, if anybody's not working on Saturday and you wanna come, we have a random channel where people will post their pets. We have we give the option and it is not required to participate, but I'm telling you, we have four or five people who have left Lady Justice, um, who you know have full-time jobs and they're like, it was just getting to be too much. I couldn't bartend anymore, who still actively participate daily in Slack because they <laughs> love the community that we've built, right? So we create that space. We have lots of silly conversations. We have a channel called Beer Names. And if you think of a silly beer name, it's dropped in there. Um, and that's where our former employees are crushing it. The new beers that are coming out at Lady J, if you see their names, they are former employees who just think it's fun and silly. What's your Slack favorite beer name cool. someone's recently added? Um, Ski Jorts, uh, which is our pale ale, has been killing it. <laughs> and that is shout out to Paul, who uh, I grew up with and uh, bartends like three times a year when we need him for events. And he said, oh, yeah, at the end of the season, I put on my shortest jorts and go skiing. Those are my ski jorts. It kills. It does great. It's a perfect pale ale name. It works no matter the season. It's like very Colorado. Um, so th that's it. Like we just, we create the space to have fun. We create the space to build community, which is what our team wants. Our staff meetings are always fully attended. There's always food. Everybody brings Tupperware so they can take food home. And we really enjoy doing the work part and then just spending time with one another. So it makes a difference when you create standardized process. Our staff knows to expect the email at the beginning of the week on Monday or Tuesday explaining what's going on for the week and checking Slack if they see a tag pop up. Otherwise, you don't have to look at it. Check it before your shift. See if anything's changed. Hey, this new beer's on line two. Great. Awesome. Oh, you need to clean the line? Okay, if you can do that. Quick. Like, all the information you need is exactly right there. They know exactly awesome. what to expect it. Thanks, Allison. And for everyone else, you know, what other technologies are you doing to improve communication between your teams? Allison mentioned Slack. Is anyone else using some other things you're really passionate about? We use a project management software called Basecamp, which is similar, has kind of that same functionality. We've been playing around with Homebase, which is actually a scheduling app, but it has uh, 
it has the opportunity to send out messages and based on you know managers or brew staff or front of house. So that's been that's been nice too. Yeah, I know uh, our front of house team or our retail team that did beer garden and restaurant, they use seven shifts and that was a good effective communication thing. But I think Allison hit the nail on the head too is, you know, you got to m- use something that people want to use and you also don't want to be invasive. You know, that was one thing that used to drive me crazy is I was in so many text groups and it's like, I'd be on vacation and my phone it's would just be going isn't it, Josh? Yeah. And it's, so I really like teams. And I know it's really hard to get people to, to try that. And I'm a Mac guy, so that does cause some issues sometimes, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's so nice to be able to turn it off and be able to know like, hey, this is work related. And Allison, I really love what you said about like creating the fun random channels too, because I think that fosters that community and that communication between departments in a non-work way. And that was something that I always really enjoyed about, you know, being where I was is, you know, at the end of the day, we all enjoyed our shift beers together. So, um, you know, if you weren't there, you felt like you were missing out. So to have a digital way that you can do that kind of streamlines that communication, I think that's really cool. So. Um, yeah, lots of cool ways to just continue to to foster communication. Well, while we're talking about the more informal ways to build relationships between your team, you know, Allison, you talked about the fun channel on Slack. What types of activities have you all done at your breweries or businesses to connect people in a little bit deeper, more human level? We added a, so we were worried about those silos. And so we added a monthly manager happy hour and it helped like twofold, we go to an account. And so we're showing some love to an account and getting our name out there and paying with the company card and talking about being from Kettle House. And those, you know, different department leads are getting connected. And then we found that that wasn't a wide enough net. And so quarterly, we just invite the entire company and some people it's their day off, they don't have to come, but we've had great attendance. And it's just a great informal opportunity for people to get to know one another and i think that helps when you humanize the other department you take pause you know that that's your buddy sally and you know you're going to ask sally what did you mean by that rather than make assumptions and so being able to just connect more often has been a game changer for us yeah then you become more than just Brittany and hr you become an actual person who has hobbies interests friends and family yeah it's really important you're like, oh, yeah, now I know I can call her for the ski report all winter long. <laughs> Love it. Jen, how about you? We have uh, a few, like, full staff parties or picnics throughout the year where we just we close down and, and we give everybody the opportunity to hang out with their families and kind of the same vibe. Um, we also, we have a really great, like, post-shift hangout groups, too, where the employees, we encourage, you know, we encourage them to sit together and, and learn about each other and talk about the off work, uh, which has, it's been a great team building opportunity as well. And I love to jump in on those with the, <laughs> with even with the younger staff, you know, and learn, learn about all the new employees. And so it's a great way to hang out. Jen, a lot of breweries, you know, are a little hesitant about having their teams hang out together, become really friendly, especially with management. It sounds like you embrace that and want your team to be there. I say a family versus just people who work together. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, we have lines to run, but I think overall, we really, it really is a family vibe. We have, we have uh, adult managers that have been here for 20 years whose kids are, are now bussing tables or, you know, it's, and, and we see that constantly, like generations of when you've been open for that long, you know, you get to see, you get to see them come through. So it's, it really, and it's a small town that we live in of, you know, 8,000 people. So a lot of them know each other outside of work already anyway. And it just, it creates that the little JBC crew pack that <laughs> they all help each other out during the shift and, and out. Do you ever find that people who are new to your team feel like an outsider when they first join? And if so, like, you know, what do you do to make them not feel that way and make them feel more welcome? I, I think it happens, um, especially with the younger, with the, you know, with the younger group. Um, but everybody is what we we just try to encourage everyone to to talk and and communicate and hang out. Um, we we do that as managers also. We really do try to get to know the team. And even if it's trying to like, I had two people that like to craft, and maybe they didn't talk a lot. And it's if I can get them together, I'll be like, so what are you working at? Like, what are your projects this week? And get them to chat. So just building the getting to know people, I guess, and spreading it around. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> Gosh, how about at Market My Brewery and your past experiences? You know, what are some good team building activities that you've experienced? 
Yeah, I know at the previous brewery I was at, you know, I used to call it force fun and there was definitely a few of us who felt that way, but you know, they, we would do these quarterly town halls where the, the first hour was kind of a business update. You know, what, where are things at? What are we working on? Kind of that communication aspect where you forget that not everybody realizes what the marketing team is working on or what our new release is going to be and things like that. So um, kind of got the business out of the way, but then, you know, it really was the, the team did a great job of trying to connect departments and kind of do team games where it was kind of a mashup. And sometimes that goes over well, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, I think it, it did help us in the long run by kind of, again, humanizing each other and people who never see each other because, you know, it's a brewer on the overnight shift is now interacting with um, the tap room staff who d does the lunch shift and then just never get it connect were able to connect. And so I think that was a great thing. And then, you know, I, I think um, Jen hit the, the nail on the head too. Like our shift beer policy at my previous brewery was, was pretty generous. It was two beers at the end of your shift. And, you know, pretty much everybody took advantage of that. And I think that was a way that everyone could kind of decompress and get to know each other on a personal level. And sometimes it was like, hey, I had a rough day and I just need to talk to somebody. And other times it was like, hey, I'm hosting a poker game this week and you should come out. So I think just providing those opportunities, but also being aware that you need to be able to draw the lines and, and make sure that everybody's doing it safely and that you're not fostering a coup or some other things like that. Like you kind of got to control the conversation a little bit. Yeah. And Allison, you know, at Lady J, you run a pretty lean staff. How do you take time to, you know, have these moments where you connect on a more personal level? So we have, because of that, it's actually Besides really- Besides you, um, that, you know, going home at the end of the night and, you know, <laughs> living your life. Yeah. Being married to your business partner means that work is never done. Um, but beyond that, uh, that's not our staff's problem, which is actually a gift. Um, so we are really fortunate. We all truly, really like the staff we have right now deeply love spending time with one another. We keep up with each other. Like our tapper manager just texted me her new haircut because I'm like, how do you get your bangs like that? Like that's the level that we're at, right? It feels like we're just good friends. We take the time in our monthly staff meetings. We'll start with the business. So here's what's going on. Here's what's coming up on tap. Here are the events that we have going. Like we really, we just kind of start with the, ex and again, with that system, our, we keep a running agenda. And so we keep the same formatting. We start with events. We start, then we go into beer. Um, hey, we're, you know, pouring at this. Does anyone want some extra hours? We'll put in all that conversation. Um, we'll talk about if there's any like staffing changes, right? If we're a small team and somebody leaves, it makes a huge impact. And so we'll talk through that. If it's, you know, positive, negative, whatever happened, we want to talk about it. Um, and then we allow time for staff questions. Then we'll try and do something that feels a little bit like special and planned. So like off flavors tasting, or let's talk about the difference between ales and lagers. Like we'll do that type of stuff because most of our staff is coming from nonprofit backgrounds, not actually from beer. And so it's really fun to talk with them about Let's talk through this. We loved, and then we'll do, you know, practice rounds. Pretend like you're selling me a beer and I walk in and I say, I hate beer. Like we go through and do that type of stuff. A lot of times because we're a small staff and we do the over communication, those meetings can be light. We can run through it a half hour and then we have that extra time. And that's when it's, we're gonna play a game. We're gonna do something fun. We're gonna prep for next time staff meeting, which is gonna be a holiday event, right? Um, something like that, where we know we're planning far enough in advance that we can create something fun. So we were supposed to have a staff meeting today, but Betsy and I are here. And so we were like, there's actually not a ton going on. We can wait until next week. Let's give you the, back that time. So we have it planned um, once a month on Mondays when we're closed as our staff meetings, once a month on Fridays or bi-monthly, depending um, our leadership team meetings. We have a leadership team Slack channel that's super active. And so we talk there and our leadership team will get together and talk through things. Like if we want to introduce a new food or we're going to start a new cocktail, we're going to do that type of stuff. We drop in that channel. Hey, if anyone's available today at four, we're going to meet at this bar and try six old fashions. And it's going to be super fun. And we're all going to do that together. So come if you can, don't if you can't, but get ready for us to talk about old fashions on the Slack channel, right? Really clear. And again, like pr as standardized as we can be so that it's convenient for everybody, especially like if you have part-time employees, make things as easy and accessible as you can for them. Don't make it bending over backwards to have to come to things. When we, when we are going through the hiring process, hey, we have monthly staff meetings on Mondays at 6 p.m. Does that work for you? You are paid during that time. You are fed a meal. You can have all the beer you want. Don't get weird at the staff. <laughs> Nobody ever gets weird at the staff meeting. But like, we can talk through what that looks like. Again, creating just as standard of a system as possible because people assume beer is fun and loosey goosey and not hard work. 
you're instilling the fact that yes, this is hard work. We're all taking the time. Like I'm taking the time to plan out the schedule for you and I want it to kick ass and I want it to be a good use of your time. So let's make that happen. It really shows initiative and shows that, okay, for Allison to make craft beer fun, she's actually working pretty hard behind the scenes. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. It sounds like, you know, you are doing a good job of making these meetings more enjoyable than your, yeah, that's such a great job work there. Now for everyone else, what do meetings look like at your brewery? I'd love to hear the types of meetings that you have and the frequency that they happen. We do uh, bi-weekly meetings with the floor managers, which we have eight to 10 usually on staff. And that's, we run two shifts a day. So the hardest part of communication with that group is getting everybody on the same page and to do the same. I'm, I'm liking the Slack channel idea. Uh, we still use the old school text group, which has worked out pretty well for us. Um, but the meetings are, there is an agenda. We have the same thing, like what events are coming up. We do catering. So what a catering events are coming in, what do we need to prep for? Uh, what's going on in the brewery? What just came on? What's going to be off soon? Um, what we have in the works. And then we always have an opportunity of like things we notice and, and this is pretty much an open discussion. We, the management, like upper management might come with a couple ideas of, you know, what we can do better or what we go over reviews a lot, like customer reviews and what, uh, how could we have done this differently? You know, did, did someone do this differently than what everybody else does and how can we get all on the same page? Um, and lots of building, lots of SOPs for things that we realize in that process that we don't have a process for. Um, it's been productive. Brittany, what a yeah. meeting like a kettle house. We every department has a monthly meeting and they it, it's kind of department centric. So, you know, sales is like a first thing in the morning on a Monday, get everything lined out. I think theirs might be bi weekly, not monthly. Production, it's done late in the day on a Thursday. We've run four ten, so some people work Monday, Thursday, some are that Tuesday, Friday. But it's late afternoon, so everyone can grab a beer and kinda it's almost the end of the week for most of the crew and they can go out on a high note retails is midday. So it's based on kind of what, what works for every department. Our management team runs a, a monthly meeting where it's just kind of information sharing, pretty informal kind of going through check-ins. And then we might be the only company that found like more meetings. We found a benefit to like certain targeted one-on-ones. Like I would meet with the president the head brewer would meet with the president and then it was the telephone game of like, well, he's struggling with this thing. Oh, well, he should try this. And at one point I was like, why don't we just meet? Why, why are we going through you? Let's just me and him meet once a month and talk about, you know, staffing issues that he might need some assistance coaching people. And, and certainly we'll meet more frequently if something big comes up, but that's just those little micro corrections that, can wait until the first Thursday of the month. And I think they, you know, our head of sales and our head brewer found that it was beneficial for them to meet more frequently. So they can just kind of start having conversations and it's not that once a month, like, oh, we've made this really great, you know, light lager and sales be like, we can't sell a light lager right now. They can actually figure that out ahead of time before somebody gets, like Allison said, really passionate about it and really wrapped up and really excited only to get their balloon popped. Yeah, I think at my previous organization, we had way too many meetings, um, but there was some things that kind of came out of, I think a lot of people working from home got put on meetings and then you just kind of got stuck in the thing. And I think some of the things that we learned from that process um, that I think would be a good reflection was always having an agenda, know what the meeting's about and have that in advance um, that was huge for me is to be able to kind of understand, okay, what mind space do I need to be in when I walk into this meeting to make sure that everything is, is necessary. And then auditing your meetings, you know, making sure like, hey, does everybody in this meeting really need to be here? Because I think sometimes meetings tend to shift in their focus in cases. And as they go on and it just becomes part of your routine, you're like, okay, I'm going to go to this go to market meeting and I'm going to sit here and, you know, none of this is really relevant for me. And this, if there's a, maybe there's a random question one time a month and we meet seven times a month, like, what am I really doing? So I think that's an important thing to remind everybody is, you know, meetings are important, getting people together, and especially in person. I'm a huge advocate for that. But, you know, kind of taking the time to be like, okay, why does this meeting exist? Are we sticking to why it exists? And does everybody here need to be here? And then another best practice that I really enjoyed was never doing 30 minute or 60 minute meetings, always doing 20 minute or 50 minute meetings and saving that 10 minutes at the end. There's a lot of value in that, um, that allows everybody to kind of decompress from the meeting they were just in, 
go knock out a few checklist items and then prepare for their next meeting if there is one behind that. Um, there was a lot of value in that. And I, I enjoyed that time where it was like, okay, I've got my stuff. I'm scrambling to the next conference room. And then it's like, wait, what was I supposed to do for that one? So, um, you know, I think that would be my best insight on meetings is auditing them, making sure you have an agenda and then giving people time to get from meeting to meeting. Cause there are cases where, uh, people may be in meetings all day, uh, which is yeah, great. I've been very hesitant, but wanting to change my meeting time slots to 20 minute and 50 minute slots. So I think you might've kind of pushed me over the edge to make that happen. Now, going back to the agendas and outlines you have when you go into meetings, Josh, is this something that the meeting organizer puts together, of course, but are they sharing it with all the attendees prior or is the organizer the one just sticking to it and making sure you know we don't get off topic? Yeah, I think we found the best practice was to share it out in advance um, just to kind of understand, you know, and if there's any key action items from a previous meeting to kind of have those in there, too, because, again, everybody gets it's crazy. This industry is wild and things change so quickly. So to kind of understand, OK, what am I walking into? Where am I supposed to be talking in this in this aspect and having that in advance and then, you know, showing it in person as well? There's going to be changes. I mean, that's the one inevitable thing in this industry is change. And so uh, meetings shift as well. But, yeah, having that agenda in advance uh, was huge as far as the product of the meeting for everyone else how do you keep your meetings organized we don't necessarily have a time frame but we do have an agenda and we do try to leave time at the end for just open discussion too whether it's whether it's off work topic or or things that other people can bring to the table Jen how important do you believe that open feedback at the end is to helping bring people together Huge. I think giving them that opportunity to say, hey, I noticed something that, you know, I think we could do it this way, or I think this would make it easier for everybody. Um, one, like when somebody bring, we encourage people to bring ideas to the table, even if they're crazy. Uh, and when somebody is part of an idea that actually grows legs and, and helps the team, uh, it's like big confidence boost. And I mean, we're always looking for ways to be more efficient. So it's a, it's a good open open discussion. No, no, meetings, they can easily go off topic. There can be some weird tangent or rabbit hole that we go down. Brittany at Kettle House, what strategies, and Allison, you're next in this one. You know, how do you handle it when someone takes a meeting in a direction that wasn't necessarily part of the plan? <laughs> that makes me laugh because we do have a few people that really like that. They'd, they'd go for three hours if they could. I think building trust and security and then being able to tell them like, hey, not right now. And I, I was just talking to a manager about this soon because one, one person on their team is particularly prone to that of saying like, hey, just appreciate their comment, thank them for what they had to say, and then tell them you can schedule a follow-up meeting to talk about that particular thing. Like, that's not what we're here to talk about today. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, if this is warrants a, an email or whatever it is, and I think once you've built trust with people, they know that they're taking it off topic. Most of those people who are super chatty or, you know, tend to go, I, I can be a tangential person. Like, if you tell me that I'm going down the rabbit hole, I know that about myself. So being able to just, I call it calling time, like call time and be like, hey, not right now. And most of the time, they're totally cool with that. I went to a meeting recently where speakers were allowed a certain number of minutes to get their point across. And I thought that was really valuable. It helped stay to the timeline. Allison, you were nodding your head a minute ago. We started talking about staying on track. Yeah. What you got to say? So um, again, having a small team is really helpful for us because they're actually really good to be like, hey, can we hold off on that? And no, like, we're just kind of a no feelings get hurt type of people. Um, but I always like to call this out because we have it in, um, the Lady Justice uh, Brewing Company was started by my wife and two other founders, and we all served in AmeriCorps together. And in our larger AmeriCorps group, we have a rule called shenanigans. And if somebody says shenanigans at any point in time, you must cease discussion. The conversation has ended. Um, so we haven't had to implement that at Lady J. We'll sometimes say it, and like those of us who are in the know will stop because it, we'll call it on each other, right? If it's like me to Betsy, me to Kate, vice versa. But calling out shenanigans is a no feelings are hurt, but we're going to stop talking about this now. Um, it has been game changingly useful. Um, it sounds silly, but like, you know, fans of How I Met Your Mother, that's a joke that's on the show as well. It's just like there's a way that you can just say, we're done talking about this, table it, bring it back later. Um, 
no feelings are hurt. That way it's just, you know, if you're getting too deep into a wormhole and you're just like, okay, we could, yes, let's talk all about hoppy loggers until our faces fall off. But is this useful to the space? <laughs> no, um, we can all talk about that, you know, wild regular who comes in all the time, but like, is it useful to the staff meeting? It's not right. So um, calling shenanigans is it like, if you feel like you've got the type of staff that can handle that, where you say no feelings are hurt during this, you get to accept that, which means you get to call it on people. Um, and for folks who practice EOS, um, tangent is what they call it there, where you just get to say tangent and it means, oh, you have gone too far out of the way. And if you say it's not a tangent, it most likely is. And you're trying to really connect the point by dragging things through. So EOS folks know what I'm talking about when you say tangent, it's the exact same thing. So a tip from Allison, have your own shenanigans. <laughs> now, yep. I think it's so important in our industry to know the language we're all speaking. We work in beards. There's a lot of special terminology we need to know. Josh, you know, to get really granular with it, how does knowing the correct lingo impact relationships between departments? Yeah, I think it's super important. And in, in my last role as brewery educator, that's really what I tried to do and kind of be that information highway and try to make sure that I always understood where everybody was, which was taxing. Don't get me wrong. I would not sign anybody up for this role. But um, but taking that on and understanding that, allowing you to kind of understand like, okay, sales and marketing is trying to achieve this task. This is really what they want to do. They don't always know how to communicate that to production to kind of say like, hey, here's what we're doing and here's why we need it. So kind of being able to, to speak the lingo, one might say, and translate, you know, essentially sales and marketing speak to production speak and then vice versa. Because uh, there were several times where somebody would dream up some crazy idea, which crazy ideas are amazing. That's what's driven this industry. But you have to kind of understand like what the possibilities are or how we could get there. And I think sometimes not knowing that language is like, you know, we had someone come on the team who had previously come from CPG and, you know, they essentially were the customer. Well, in a brewery, you're not the customer, you're the producer and you're, it's your responsibility. So, you know, she would make the comment like it needs more of this. And it's like, well, it's not really that easy because with that comes other things too. So, you know, we found that by educating everybody, giving people opportunity to kind of cross train to an extent, we offered a lot of uh, training courses that were open to everybody to kind of get people's knowledge level up because yeah, I mean, you may be saying the words, but they don't mean what you think they mean or vice versa. You're just missing the word that will connect the dots. And I think it's infinitely important to, to be able to kind of understand how everybody works and, and be able to have that vocabulary. But that is also infinitely challenging. Josh, are there any words or phrases or concepts in particular that have caused more problems than others? I think just flavor analysis, like everybody's like, oh, it needs more orange. It's like, wait, hold on. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't translate like that or um, little things like that or people who they, like it needs something, but they can't tell you what it needs. And it's so frustrating because it's like, okay, I don't know what you're asking. And, and that is that that doesn't allow me to do anything like that. Feedback isn't helpful. So just trying to empower people to be like, hey, you need to verbalize what you're actually looking for. Because, um, yeah, that used to really stress the brewers out. They, someone would say, oh, I don't like this. And they're like, well, what don't you like? And they're like, I don't know. I just don't like it. It's like, OK, well, I don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> no, I think a lot of the language issues can be solved by cross training. What do all of you do at your breweries and businesses that, you know, helps breweries learn more about other departments, whether it's someone from the tap room working in the brew house or, you know, what does that education, you know, cycle look like for everyone? We do that, exactly what you just said. Um, we have our tap room manager uh, learn how to clean kegs. Most of us help out on the canning line. Um, one of our employees who started front of house is now our assistant brewer. So a lot of folks just get to be as hands-on as they want to be. We also do a beer tender series. And so it gets a beer tender to come in back and they get to brew a beer alongside Betsy and our assistant brewer, Meg. Um, it's really useful. They get to experience what that looks like. Um, it's very fun because a lot of them say, I'll just come in and do it before my shift. And Betsy always encourages them not to do that. And they say, no, it'll be fine. And then they're like, I'm so tired. And Betsy says, I know we have now understood one another right it's it's really useful everybody wins then they get to sell their own beer which is really really fun in the tap room it creates a really good and healthy synergy and so um again we're a tiny baby tap room you can see the brew house from wherever you are standing inside of lady justice because it's a giant glass window and we're like just a few feet wide i swear so we're all pretty involved, but allowing that option has been a game changer for us, right? They get to come in and brew. They can come in and learn how to clean kegs. They can can if they want to. Betsy and I try to bartend every once in a while because it's useful for us to get up front and see what the vibe is as of late. I'm never invited to bartend because I am terrible at reminding people to pay. Um, I'm just <laughs> chatting away and I'm like, isn't that such a fun, good beer? Okay, I'll see you. And the other beer tenders are like, 
get a card from them. <laughs> they hate when I'm back there. But um, in general, it's just it's really useful for us to do that type of work. Um, we love when staff wants to go out and pour beer at an event. Um, they get to part, like it's always with our nonprofit partners. They get to meet the nonprofit partners and they usually come back really energized about like, I loved getting to work with them. That was really cool. We just did like soccer without borders for the kickoff of the World Cup and getting kiddos involved in soccer. And that got people really excited. Right. It's really fun to give the opportunity for anyone who asks. And Allison, to confirm the opportunities at Lady Justice to get cross trained, they're optional versus required. Correct. That's right. So like some folks work full time and they're truly coming in to work their one shift. That's awesome. Um, some folks are like, hey, I'm so sick of screwing that table back together that I'm actually going to work on like getting a new base for it. And they feel like I'm like, you can go dig in the basement, and look for whatever base feels right in your heart. And then you get to be in the basement and learn about how we do storage and look at all of our marketing materials, whatever that is. Like, it's always optional. You are required to do the job that you are hired for. Anything else that you want to do, please join. We'd love to have you. No, does anyone on the panel have any required cross training at your establishment? When we, we have a training program that we follow for our servers and before they are uh, off the, the training docket, they have to do a shift in every department um, minus the brewery. They get a brewery tour, um, but like they have to work in the kitchen. Maybe they're going to do salads for a night or, or at least stand there and help. Um, so we want them to know what it's like in every, every position so they can help each other out and, and just know know the ropes. Brittany, what does it look like at Kettle House? We require managers to do some, like every manager has had to shadow a brew and do some stuff like that. But that's actually a good point of improvement for us to, to go kind of further down the department and let people, they've always had the option, they can shadow a brew, but I feel like we don't push it and they don't take advantage of it nearly enough. And as I was hearing everyone talk, I was like, we got to do that. That's a great idea. So I think our, you know, production to sales pipeline is really strong. And I think retail to production is really strong, but everything working 360 could use a little bit work of work. Yeah, I know at my previous brewery, you know, that was when I started, that was like that. You did a shift in every brewery and I, I'll never forget sitting there filling 160 half barrel kegs. The guy who was, I was supposed to be shouting was like, okay, I got to go do this. And then I was like, okay, I guess I'm running this keg filler now. And so, um, you know, that can go Ari too. It can go off the rails if you're not, really formalizing your process and that shadowing. But, you know, one of the things that I tried to foster is like, yeah, if you're interested in something like, let's get you an opportunity to shadow. And then from a cross training standpoint, it's not necessarily training, but, and I know we talked about this a little bit in a previous panel I did on onboarding, but you know, that was a big thing for us is we had the department head from every single department come in in the onboarding process, introduce who they are, what their department does. Um, and, you know, kind of open that, that line of communication out of the gate. Um, where it's like, if you have questions, this is the person you can come ask. You can always ask your manager, but here's some other people. And I think that was really powerful because it, it did give a little bit of clarity that like everybody is doing something, even if you don't see it um, and opened up those lines of communication and kind of just shared a little bit. Cause I think we had a lot of that too, where someone would come in and, you know, maybe they're starting on the retail side and they're, they're a server, but really they find an interest for, you know, logistics. It's like, okay, cool, let's pull you in. And, and now you're doing logistics for us. And that was something they didn't even realize was an option. So I think the opportunity to kind of understand that the brewing world is a lot of different aspects. It's not just making beer and serving it um, can allow you to find some great talent as well. No, absolutely. And Brittany, something Josh touched on leads into something that you do at Kettle House. You assign port, point people for certain things and processes so that other departments know exactly who they should contact if they have a problem. Can you talk to me a little bit about this? Yeah, so that emerged from we had someone who worked in the office at a certain point who just was never going to tell you they didn't know the answer. And they meant really well, but they were sometimes sharing information that then had to be kind of undone. So, you know, oh, yeah, I know that the insurance is like this or I know that that particular beer is on this schedule. And it was like, oh, no, no, it's not. And so our operations manager kind of divvied up like, this is who does this, this is who does this, and then shared that company wide. You've got a payroll question, come to me. You've got a question on merchandise, go to Madeline. And other departments found that so helpful when they were like, oh, I've got a question about X, Y, Z, that they started doing that. Okay, you've got a shipping and receiving question, you go to Josh. If Josh isn't available, here's who you go to next. And as we've grown, that's been super helpful because the head brewer has to be in 20 different places. We've got multiple locations. 
and they now know, okay, if Zach's not there, I would go to Drew for this or Matt for this. And people just can look that up and know who to talk to. And it has just alleviated so much kind of stress and and definitely the need to backtrack. If like someone heads down a road and then finds out, whoops, that was that was I was operating on bad information. Brittany, I think the big thing with the oh sorry. Brittany, you mentioned there's a place they can look it up. Is there like a chart somewhere? Is there a handbook? Where do they find the person they need to talk to for a specific issue? Yeah, so we use Basecamp, which is like a project management software. And so we just have an area of Basecamp that has lots of information, you know, everything from the, the uh, payroll schedule to a holiday schedule. And that's right there, too. So right where you can find everybody's extensions and, and information, you can also figure out like, okay, I've got this and you know it's pretty broad so there's still that need for like i have this very specific question but they at least know who to start with and we've also recently taken that one step further we were finding outages of you know silly stuff paper towels and and our operations manager um implemented kanban cards that when you get to the bottom it says who you talk to you go to the office and tell them you're out of paper towels or you go to you know, the lead seller person, if you're out of this particular grain. So Josh, yeah, you. I was just going to add. I think the key to that too, with the point person, because we've run into that where it's like, okay, this is the logical point person for this, but that person either isn't really good at communicating or on email or things like that, or they just simply don't have the bandwidth to field those questions. So I think it's important to not only assign the point person, but also assign the responsibilities of the point person to them, because it's really easy to be like oh, that's not an important question. It's like, well, every question is important. That's why they're asking it. So kind of making sure that that person has the bandwidth and also understands the responsibility of being the point person. Because I've definitely had experiences with that where it's like, I've emailed them three times and I haven't heard anything. And then they're like, oh yeah, I just, I blew it off. And it's like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Make sure they're into being the point person. <laughs> yes, yeah. So somewhat related to point people, you know, having the person in charge of a certain aspect, Josh, how do you believe having an intermediary can help connect both sides and bridge the gaps for each group and be beneficial? Yeah, I think having an intermediary can can save a lot of time for the two groups. Like I said, it, it's a big weight to put on the shoulders of the intermediary. Um, and again, it's, it's not something I would ever really encourage somebody to do unless you have the personality to do it. But that was essentially the responsibility that I got put on my shoulder. So, you know, sitting in on the production to understand what struggles are they going through, what's going on. So that when, when I'm sitting in sales and marketing and they come up with a genius idea, we can set the expectation and say, hey, just so you know, they're, they have a whole bunch of things going on over here. I don't think they're going to be able to get to that, but let me go see and kind of serve that. So you, you kind of get pulled in both directions. And um, but ultimately, we found that it helped kind of leave the tensions beside or, you know, aside. And it was like, OK, let me just kind of speak in your terms what they're going through. So that way we can all understand each other. But, yeah, it led to me sitting in a, a lot more meetings than I would have ever liked. Um, but it streamlined the company. And that was that it really did help. And so if you can find a way to do that, whether it's on a, a couple of small aspects and you have different people who are serving as intermediary, I think there can be some huge value. Awesome. Well, thanks, Josh. Now, today we've talked about a lot of different strategies to improve communication between departments, but how do you evaluate the success of this communication and perhaps when procedures need to be reevaluated? We do a lot of like pull surveys. So we have some of the back end stuff on our HRS software that we use, like just kind of asks questions of like, it, it's called a net promoter score. So it basically you rate like on a scale of one to 10, you know, how you feel and, and then why is that? And we look at those and we take them really serious. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's just as simple as like explaining one of the ones that just came up was we need sick leave. Well, we just explained, Hey, we just do it all in one because in the state of Montana, sick leave is not compensable versus if we do it all as paid time off, we've rolled your sick leave into that. You can bank that. If you don't leave, you get paid out for that. And they're like, Oh, well, that's a way better deal than sick leave. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> it's just all about setting expectations and, and continuing to reframe those expectations and, and just listening. Setting expectations. Love it. Jen, how, how about you? You know, James Port's been there quite a bit. You said 23 years, right? Three years. Yeah. O over all that time, you know, how do you ev evaluate the success of communication and whether it needs to be reevaluated? So, I, for a long time, the the brewery was an island, and they 
they kind of ran their own program and did what they want. And when the beers popped up upstairs, it was, it was, uh, you know, that was the time to educate. So we've really, really worked on making the brewery a bigger focus of, of the restaurant upstairs and making sure that everybody knows, even though it's a little spot in the basement, <laughs> that it's a big part of who we are. Um, so bringing the, bringing the staff up, we actually, right now, our assistant brewer also works in the kitchen. So talk about the cross trading on, on that realm. Um, it's, it's something we still we're still working on even after 23 years and it especially as managers change because styles change and um i liked you know like like josh said pulling out uh the strengths of people and recognizing those and giving them jobs or or things to oversee um that's that's helped to spread we delegate a lot and spread the wealth and and try to work together no, you all have shared a ton of great insight over the past hour. I'd like to conclude with one thing. We like people when they watch these panels, whether they're listening live on YouTube or on Spotify later after the fact, to have that one action item they feel a sense of urgency to do. I, I love to go around the table and we'll start with you, Brittany. For everyone listening, what is the one thing they need to do right now to improve and better communication at their brewery? Um, not assign other people's intent. Ask, their, ask a question not assume that this person did this for this reason, or I think they did it because they're mad at me. Just, you know, it's hard and it's scary, but ask them, hey, Andrew, what did you mean by that? Because nine times out of 10, you'll find that the story that you wrote up here is different than the one that was actually intended. And then once you have that conversation, you're like, oh, well, they didn't mean that like that. And it's just, it's a game changer to just take the intent out of the question and ask if you, if you need to clarify something. That's a really good one. Jen. I just getting people together, you know, I know meetings is scary, uh, <laughs> scary word sometimes in our industry, but, uh, getting, getting everybody together to get them on the same page and making it fun. Definitely. Josh. Yeah, I would just encourage everybody, not right now, because it's a very busy time for all brewers uh, with Oktoberfest and all the fun things that come in the holidays, but take some time, find some time in your schedule to audit your meetings. You know, do they make sense? Does, do the attendees make sense? Are you putting out an agenda? Um, is everybody able to make it to their next meetings? Like kind of asking those questions and, and ensuring that the meetings are productive, because if you go in and you're in a bad mood because you don't want to be in the meeting, that just continues to spiral. So find the time to do a meeting audit and make sure that what you're doing um, is helping because meetings for the sake of meetings are not good for anybody. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those out there. Agreed. Allison? Standardize, standardize, standardize. Um, it will set you up for success as you grow. We have 10 people now, but I run a tight ship as if I have 100. Um, I come from a tech marketing background, and I literally just started as of last month full time at the brewery. So I run my meetings as if I'm running them in, you know, at one of my former employers. It gives everybody the same set expectations so that nobody comes in surprised and can say, well, I didn't know. When you set standards and you repeat them over and over, you are creating a basis for success for your team. Love it. And that kind of is a great tie in. Josh, you're going to be leading a panel on standardizing a uh, brewery information also at panel fest. That's going to be a really good one. And Josh, I appreciate you and market my brewery and all your support. So thanks again for sharing your insight and being here and being so involved. Brittany and Jen, it was awesome to have you today. It was almost as awesome to seeing you in person as it was in Milwaukee. And Allison, you actually are in Milwaukee today. I don't know how we plan that, but <laughs> tell the crew at Mobcraft, we say hello. That was an amazing brewery to spend time at. But I appreciate all of you for sharing your wonderful insight. And I hope everybody has enjoyed this panel and enjoyed the rest of Panel Fest. We'll see you all soon. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Cheers everyone.